Well, our first message this evening is entitled, well, the program is entitled, What About Creation? This message is called The Age of the Earth. How old is this planet that we live on? You know, there's different opinions out there, but we are searching for the truth. So before we begin, I just ask that you'll bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for being our God. I pray that you will bless us now as we talk about the age of the earth. We give the time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. How old is the earth? And the question is, is how would you know? How could you scientifically test and verify how old this planet is that we live on? It's a good question. Here we have a, a shoreline, and on the shoreline you have rocks. And these are relatively good sized rocks. And as you notice that these rocks are particularly, uh, they're, they're curved. So obviously some erosion has taken place to bring them to this point. So how old are these rocks? How old is this shore? It's a good question. We have plants. You can see grass growing there. And if you back off, you can actually get a picture of this particular island. Now the question is, is how old is this island, or what island is this? This island's name is Circe. Now, the question is, is how old is Circe? And the, another question would be, how old would you know? Or how would you even be able to know how old this island is? And we're going to read here. This was an Icelandic geologist. I lived in Iceland for the better part of a year. His name was Sigurður Thorarinsson, and he says, when geologists in the spring and summer of 19... 64. So notice this island came about in 1964, wandered about the island. They found it hard to believe that this was an island whose age was still measured in months, not years. What elsewhere may take thousands of years may, have, may be accomplished in Iceland in one century, and Circe, the same development may take a few weeks or even a few days. Now the interesting thing is there was no island there in Iceland, or at least no island off the coast of Iceland named Circe just a year or two before this. Literally within weeks, within months, this island emerged out of the ocean. Amazing. And not only that, it emerged looking basically like any of the other islands there in Iceland. <coughs> and so how would you know how old the other islands are? If this island came up looking like other islands, even had plants growing on it very soon after it came about, how would you be able to know how old the other islands were? Now, the other islands are considered to be, you know, maybe tens of 10,000 10, or more years old. Now, how would they know that? How could they verify scientifically how old an island or a portion of the Earth is? That's a good question. We're going to be looking into that. There it is sitting just behind my head, that little looks like a little pan out there in the ocean when I was living there in Iceland. Now, Iceland's a really interesting place to live in. And, you know, Iceland is green, and Greenland is what? Icy, right? So they kind of have the opposite names there. But they have this island that really revolutionized maybe the way we look at how this earth was made, or at least how maybe continents could be formed. Things could be made very quickly. But we're going to be looking into this. Here's another picture of just the island of Circe. And there are those rocks that would deceive you, making you think that this was very, or just as old as maybe any of the other islands. Now, in the book of Genesis, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's an interesting thought. Now, the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, can we actually believe that? Well, Psalms chapter 33, verse 6 and 9 says something very interesting. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. It goes on to say in verse 9, it says, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. What the Bible says is that God spoke this earth into existence. He said, let there be and it was. You see, whatever God says comes to pass. What he says happens. That's the power of the word of God. You see, the power of the word of man is it's almost non-existent. If I say, let there be, what happens? Well, if I'm a boss, maybe somebody's going to do what I say, but the reality is there's no power in my natural word. But there's power in the word of God. God says, let there be, and there was. That's exactly what happened. Now, the question is, so God made this world by speaking. When he says something, the molecules lined up. 
He spoke this world into existence. Now the question is, is how old is the earth? How old would we, how would we be able to know? Well, we're looking at a, right here is a chart that shows the ages of the generations starting with Adam. We begin with Adam at the top, we go down to his son Seth, on through Enos, and the interesting thing is if you would go back in history, take the ages of the sons of Adam and go back through time and you added them up, you would, you would realize that this earth, according to the Bible, is somewhere around 6,000 years old. Somewhere around 6,000 years old. Now, we're not given an exact date, you know, 4,004 at 2 p.m. We don't, we don't really know that. But we do know that the, that the Bible says that the earth is about 6,000 years old. Now, that's interesting. Because there are basically two concepts in this planet. Here is a timeline giving the timeline of the earth's history. We see that about 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. About 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It destroyed everything. This earth was covered with water. Now you say, is there actually enough water on this planet to cover the whole earth? Oh, this is ridiculous. The interesting thing is there's enough water on this planet to cover the entire earth about a mile and a half deep. It's very plausible. Now, after that, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth, became a human being, lived the life, and went through the difficulties that we have to go through. And here we are, waiting just after the year 2000, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to return. He's going to come back to bring his people home. But there's a very different viewpoint taught in many science classes. It's called the theory of evolution. Now, according to the theory of evolution, about 20 billion years ago, all the nothing in the universe gathered together to a singular point about the size of a period at the end of a page. Very dense, very hot, and this, this spinning mass of, uh, of earth, or of everything actually, everything in the universe, not of earth, and this exploded. And when it exploded, it shot off hydrogen and maybe a little bit of helium, they say. Nobody saw it, you can't test it, you can just believe it. You can only believe this. And now, this gas that shot out of the Big Bang did something that gas never does. It gathered together into areas and became what we call suns. So it gathered together. Imagine someone smoking a cigarette and they blow out the smoke from their mouth and all of that smoke gathering together to one point. It never happens. But in, in the evolutionary theory, this had to have happened. Mathematically, maybe they try to come up with things or whatever they do to try to prove it, but you can't prove it. You can only believe it. You can imagine it. So it takes faith. It's a faith-based system. So about 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang happened, they say, and about 4.6 billion years ago, Earth was formed, or at least the lava cooled down, and about 3 million years ago, man evolved, they say, from something like an ape. And here we are today, you know, we used to be called Homo sapien, and now they have come up with a new name, and the term is Homo sapien sapien, which means wise, wise man. So this is the theory. These are the two different belief systems. Now, is, can you prove that God spoke the world into existence? And the answer is no. You know what it takes? It takes faith. But you, go, you are going to see with me that it takes much more faith to believe in evolution, I believe, than it takes to believe in the Bible. So we're going to be diving into this. But the question is, is can't you harmonize these two teachings? There are, there are colleges, many, many colleges, I'm sure, that try to harmonize both, both evolution and creation. Try to take the two viewpoints and put them together into a nice little package and say, hey, we, we can work together. We can believe both of them. But the question is, can you believe both evolution and creation? The answer is no. You cannot. And the question is why. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 we read, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Now, that's interesting. The verse tells us that what brought about death? Sin. And what brought about sin? Man. So the Bible says man sinned, and his sin brought about death. 
So if man's sin brought about death, according to the Bible, was there any death before man entered into this world? Yes or no? No. Because death was brought about by sin. So can you believe that through successive generations of mutations and, and growth throughout many millions and even billions of years, slowly man evolved from some protoplasm and, and slowly changed into what we are today. And through the process, many, many extinctions took place and all of these things happened long before and millions of years before man came along. Now according to the Bible, my Bible tells me that man came and brought about death by his sin. So you cannot harmonize these two beliefs. One is right and one is wrong. But the reality is we all have freedom of choice. I believe in freedom of choice. I think it's a very blessed thing to have in this country that we can choose what we believe. If you want to believe in something that has absolutely no, found, uh, no basis, <clears throat> you're welcome to. You're absolutely welcome to. <coughs> now, what did Jesus think about this? What did Jesus think about what Moses told us in the book of Genesis? Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, we read, And he answered, speaking of Jesus, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them, Adam and Eve, at the beginning made them male and female? Now, did Jesus believe that Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were made at the beginning? Yes or no? He says that they were made at the beginning. So Jesus himself believed in the creation story found in the book of Genesis. And you know what Jesus tells us? <clears throat> well, the, we'll ask another question. Who even cares? You say, Chad, what, what does it matter? Whether you believe in, you know, the, the age of the earth is billions of years or just thousands of years. What, what, what does it matter? Well, the reality is, is that the credibility of the book of Genesis is at stake. And that's basically the foundation of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And the credibility of Jesus is at stake because it said that he quoted the book of Genesis 25 times. So he quoted this book. He believed in this book. So what about Christians? Should we believe in this book? Well, nearly every other book in the Bible quotes the book of Genesis. Now, if all of these people received false information in the beginning, can you believe them later on? This is a very serious issue. And last of all, the evolutionists care because... The, theory, the whole theory of evolution would re look ridiculous without billions of years to hide the theory in. So it's a very serious issue. Now Jesus said himself in, in John chapter 5 and verse 46 and 7, he said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Interesting. So Jesus himself says this. He says, listen, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, and who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Moses wrote this book. So he says, if you don't believe in the things that Moses told you in the book of Genesis, you cannot, you do not believe my words. So Jesus doesn't give us any room to speculate. We either take it as a whole or we leave it as a whole, one or the other. And the scientists understand that. They, many of them who, who believe in this theory realize, look, if we accept this teaching of creation, we accept the Bible. But they also realize if evolution is true, that means the Bible is false. So one is either going to be true, and in the end one is going to be false. And let's look at the moon. What does the moon tell us about the age of the earth? How old is this planet? That's a good question. This is taken from Impact Magazine, written in the 1980s. And it says, young age for the moon and the earth. Well, we're going to look at something, and this is going to be the most complicated portion of this message is right here. It's called the inverse square law. Now, the inverse square law basically says this. It says that the force of the attraction between two objects is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That just sounds like a lot of words, something that would have been very hard to understand. But basically, it's like this. If you have the planet Earth and you have the moon, now, what makes the... What, what makes the tide <coughs> rise and lower on the planet? What is it? It's the moon. So what this basically tells us, if we have the distance between the moon and the earth, and if you were to third that distance, if you were to take them and take a third of that distance, it would be nine times the attraction. It's the inverse square law. You third the distance, it, it's nine times the attraction, just to make it simple. Now, the question is, I'll give you another example. If you were to take two magnets and you held them this far apart, chances are you probably wouldn't even be able to tell that there is any attraction between the two. 
There still is, but you probably don't feel it. Now, if you take a third of that distance and you hold them together, now you start realizing, okay, there is some, there is some attraction here. Now, imagine you take a third of that, now you're about right here. And now you notice that it is much stronger at this distance. So every time you third the distance, you, quad, or you, you have nine times the attraction. So what does this mean? Did you know that we are losing the moon? Our moon is slowly fading away from planet Earth. And there's nothing to worry about. It's not going to fly off into the cosmos within the next few years. It's, we have nothing to worry about. But the reality is, is the moon is slowly going away from the planet that we live on. Well, if the moon is incrementally moving away from the Earth, then that means the moon used to be what? It used to be closer to the Earth. Does this make sense? Now, if you would extrapolate the data, if you would go back into the ages and ask the question, how, how old could this Earth be according to this, this teaching of evolution? Now, if you were to go back into Earth's history, if you were to go back 1.2 billion years, the tides would have been so powerful they would have flooded the Earth two times every single day. Now, that's a serious problem. That's a serious problem. You say, well, for a creationist who believes the Earth is 6,000 years old, that means that the moon used to be a little bit closer to the Earth. Not a problem. Adam and Eve wouldn't have had any problem with it. But for an evolutionist, now we realize our, our time frame just jumped from 4.6 billion years old to 1.2 billion years old. And you say, Chad, but that's a far cry from 4.6 billion years. Or that's a far cry from 6,000 years, rather. It's very true. This is very true. But we are going to go point by point and realize that these teachings, and I'll tell you, you will not hear these things in science class. There are many teachings that have been absolutely disproven in the science textbooks. The scientists know it, yet year after year they are printed in the textbooks and given to children as unbiased scientific fact. But the question is, is what is truth and what are we looking for? So we're looking for truth. Now, what is this? This right here is a bristlecone pine in Southern California. And I, was, I had the opportunity just a, a few months ago to drive through Southern California. And as I did, we, we happened to see a sign. We were driving near Death Valley, and we were going to go to Death Valley. And then we saw a sign, oh, the bristlecone, bristlecone pine forest. And so we thought, oh, let's go check it out. So we made it over there, and we made it just, just before dark. And this tree, the trees in this place, they call them like the patriarchs. Now, these trees are considered to be the oldest trees on planet Earth. Absolutely amazing. They're not really the biggest trees on planet Earth, but they're the oldest trees on the planet. Now, here it says in a, in a textbook, it says, well, tree ring dating is not an exact science. Trees often produce more than one ring each year. 4,300 years would be max for this tree. So this tree is considered to be close to maybe a little bit less than 4,300 years old. That is an old tree. They're, out, they're, almost, they're basically in the desert. And here these trees are, 4,300 years, still living, mind you. Still living trees. Now, I have a question. If the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, why don't we have an older tree? Now, if you were a, a thinking Christian and you understood the chronology that about 4,400 years ago there was a flood, and you would ask yourself, hey, I wonder, I wonder how old the oldest tree would be on the earth. What would you guess? You'd probably guess somewhere just under 4,400 years old. And what do you see? We see that's exactly what we find in the bristlecone pine forest, just under 4,400 years old. Now, here we have the Great Barrier Reef, there in the northeastern portion of of Australia, just up north of Brisbane. Beautiful area. My friend is getting ready to go on a trip to, he's actually in Australia now, and he's, he's planning on going off to the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I've never scuba dived, but you can imagine it would be beautiful to see all these different colors. Well, there it is, up, just a map that gives you an idea where it is. And the scientists wanted to figure out, how old is this reef? this large area of coral. So what they did is they went over to this area and they began to study the growth patterns to ask the question, how old is the Great Barrier Reef? And as they studied out the growth patterns, they discovered that this coral was less than 4,200 years old. Interesting. Now I have a question. If the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, why don't we have a larger coral? 
Why don't we have an older coal? It's a good question. I think the answer to that, no question, is that about 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says about 4,400 years ago, 4,500 years ago, somewhere around then, the Bible says there was a flood destroyed everything. You can imagine that everything that would be in the rivers, everything in the water would be churned up and finally sometime after that it would begin to settle back in and start growing again. So if you were to guess as a Christian how old is the oldest coral reef, I would guess somewhere under 4,400 years old. And guess what? You'd be exactly right. Well, in the Sahara Desert, actually all deserts, go through what is called desertification. Basically, what desertification is, is, is wind begins to blow over the desert, and as it blows over, the desert's always growing on itself. Now, they, there's, I think it's the Silver Lake Dunes, up, I believe it's up north in Michigan. I went there when I was younger with my friend Brett, and you would see that houses were be beginning to be covered with sand dunes. If you wanted to keep your house, you would have to be digging your house out. They would have to take, as far as I know, you know bulldozers and such to keep your house from being covered, because deserts always grow on themselves. Well, the scientists wanted to know about how old is the Sahara Desert. It's the largest desert in the world, by the way. So what they did was they studied it out. They said, well, from about, it looks like from about north to south, it's about 1,300 miles. And so they look at the growth patterns, how much is it growing each year. They tear out the data and they say, okay, what we have discovered is that the oldest desert on the planet is about 4,000 years old. Interesting. Now, I have a question. If the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, why don't we have an older desert? Good question, don't you think? Well, I think the Bible has a very good answer for that. About 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the Earth. About 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And the trouble is, is you cannot have a desert under a flood. Does this make sense? So if I were to guess as a Christian, how old, just by guessing, how old would you think the oldest desert would be in the Earth? on the earth, I would say, well, somewhere probably under about 4,400 years old. And guess what? That's exactly what you find there in the Sahara Desert. Very interesting. Now, you may have heard something like this in your science textbook. Here's a science textbook. And notice what it says here. It says, oil and gas are from organisms that once lived in the sea. After millions of years, the remains were slowly changed by heat and pressure into oil. So basically what they say is this. There were animals die in the sea, they sink to the bottom, and as they do, after millions of years, the pressure begins to squeeze them together and they turn into oil. That's where we, you know, fuel our cars. Well, a question is, is does it take millions of years to make oil? If it does, well, this would be a serious problem to creationists, wouldn't it? If it takes millions of years to make oil, what would a creationist do believing that the earth is only 6,000 years old? That would be a lot of trouble. Well, I'm going to show you a very neat, neat thing here. Notice with me, it says in 1996, a proposal was a $22.4 million proposal was approved in Western Australia that will build a plant that will create oil from sewage sludge in 30 million years. Is that what it says? in 30 minutes. Now, that's interesting, don't you think? They tell us it takes millions of years for these things to happen, and they say, hey, we think we need to start learning how to make and produce our own oil, and they say, we could do it in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Why don't we put these, in, these teachings in the textbooks? Show the kids the reality. Is it that someone has a bias, someone has put a lot of time and money into a theory that has no foundation, and so we can't back off now. We can't back off now on the teaching. We say, hey, listen, creation, that just takes faith. Evolution, now that's solid science. It's a theory. And this theory has no weight. It has no solid evidence, not one single thread of evidence. Well, here we have the Sinclair motor oil. And they say right here, they say, well, this is mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. Well. It's kind of interesting that as the water comes down from the sky, we call it rain now. There's no rain before the flood. No rain. The Bible actually says that, a, that waters sprang up from the earth to water the ground. But that's beside the point. Now, as the rain comes down from the sky, about 30% of that rainwater makes its way back into the ocean. And as it makes its way back into the ocean, what it does is it carries minerals 
and salts. And so the ocean is actually always gaining more minerals and more salt. So scientists, or at least people study to figure out how long would it take to make the oceans what they are today, which is 3.6% salt. So they try to discern, OK, how long would it take? And after studying this out, they say, well, the oceans could have gone from fresh water to salt water in about less than 5,000 years. You say, well, Chad, that's trouble, because the flood is 4,400 years ago, and this is 5,000 years. But think about this, my friends. Who has trouble here? Who's having trouble? The scientists, many of them, are saying that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and we see that this could have taken place in less than 5,000 years. Now, the Bible says that about 6,000 years ago, there was a flood. About 4,400 years ago, or 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. About 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It destroyed everything. And you can imagine if something as catastrophic as a flood, ripping everything up, what would happen at the same time? Massive amounts of salt, massive amounts of, of minerals would be washed into the ocean. And as they were washed in, it begins to settle back out. And so then as the rain comes down, it would look as if it would take about 5,000 years. But the Bible said, or would say, that it took about 4,400 years to make this salty sea. Well, they're in Denver, Colorado. It's a beautiful state. But in Denver, Colorado, they have an interesting place. It's called the United States National Ice Core Laboratory. It's basically a giant freezer, and they keep these long pieces of ice that they've dug, dug up. Now, why would they do this? Basically, what they did is they went over to Greenland, which is, remember, icy. And as they went there, they, they bored into the earth, and they would take out these long, not a tube, but, you know, a, a long portion of ice, and they bring it back to Denver. Well, you can see it here, and I actually added those lines so you could see them. So it's actually fake. But if you were there, you could actually see that there's many different lines. Dark light, dark light, dark light. And they call these lines annual rings. Why do you think they would call them that? Because they say, well, every year what happens is the snow comes. And as the snow comes, it packs down and it makes a white layer. And in the summer, it begins to heat up a little bit. And so it melts down a little, so you have a dark layer. And then the winter comes, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, every year. So we have what? Annual rings. Well, the scientists say, we have at least 135,000 rings. That means there are at least 135,000 years, or at least annual rings. So this is a very serious issue. Now, what would a creationist do with this issue, realizing, oh no, wouldn't, wouldn't there only be 6,000 layers? How would a creationist deal with such an issue, which is obviously the Earth is 135,000 years old? Well, it's a good question. So here it is. Here's just another look with dark light, dark light, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. Well, one of the things these scientists didn't know about was what is called the Lost Squadron. Basically what happened there in I or Greenland, a number of planes making their way over in World War II, they landed in 1942 in Greenland. And they ended up leaving them there. I don't know what happened, but they left the planes there. Well, a number of years later, a man said, listen, I'm going to go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna brush to the, brush the snow off the wings and fly them back home. You see, but when he made his way back there to Greenland, or when he made his way to Greenland, they couldn't find the planes. They were so deep under the snow and ice that they needed to use ground-penetrating radar to even find them. So here they find these planes, and when they found them, it was interesting that they were 263 feet down in the ice. 263 feet down. And that was only in 48 years. Very interesting. So what the creation scientist did is he made his way over, he made his way over and talked with one of the fellows who was there digging up these planes. And here's a picture of it. You can see some dark light, dark light layers there. Now he asked the question, he said, Sir, when you were getting these planes out of the snow and ice, did you see different layers of dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light? And the man said, Absolutely, we saw many hundreds of them. Ooh. So the scientist says, well, creation scientist, he says, let me ask you, how can you have many hundreds of layers in just 48 years? Hundreds of layers in 48 years. This just doesn't make any sense. How come these annual rings don't line up with the dates? And the man said what? He said, those aren't annual rings. Those are warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. 
you can have multiple of those in one day. Now, here we're in Michigan right now, and in Michigan, we have it in the winter that we have snow. We're even supposed to have snow coming up soon. Now, what ends up happening sometimes is you'll get a, you'll get a pile of snow, and what ends up happening is sometimes it will get wet and it will start sinking down, and then it will freeze. Have you ever experienced that? And then it will snow again on top of other snow, right? And you can have many layers of snow. Now, the very same thing happens in Greenland. And so he said, listen, there's many hundreds of layers of snow on ice, snow and ice. So what we see here is from 1942 to 1990, when they got the planes, was just 48 years. The planes were 263 below the surface. That's about 5.5 feet per year. Now, you divide that out, that's about 1,820, 1,824 feet, you know, in that amount of time, 10,000 feet deep. So, because the 10,000 feet deep, by the way, is the deepest hole they have ever dug. And the deeper the ice gets, the more it's compacted into tight layers. So, if you were to divide it out, 4,400 years it would be no problem to accumulate all the layers that we see there in green. Not a problem. Now... What do we call these? Stalactites. These are called stalactites. Now, what's interesting about these is that scientists, as they look at these, this is actually in Carlsbad in New Mexico, Carlsbad Canyon, or Carlsbad Caverns, rather. And this is called New Mexico's Unfinished Symphony. It says it was started 250 million years ago. Now, why do, why do they believe that? Why are they teaching that? It's a good question. Well, what they say is by the rate that these things are growing today, it would take about 250 million years to make them. Well, that's an interesting thought. And what scientists generally believe in is a, something called uniformitarianism. Basically, that what you see is what you get. It's the way things have always been. But this is not a very logical conclusion that over the last 250 million years, this cave has been slowly growing the exact same way without any changes. This, is, this would be an amazing thought to me. But this is what they teach. So the question is, does it take that long to make stalactites? Here we have some stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial, which was built in 1922. You say, well, here we have a bat that was covered with flow stone in less time than it took for that bat to rot. Do you think it took hundreds of years for that bat to be covered? It would have been gone. Very interesting. Now, here is a lead mine or a... a, a a mine in Mount Isa in Queensland, Australia. And by the time this picture was taken, it was, only a, it was only in 50 years old, or around 50 years old, 55 years old. Now, and you can see down in the bottom in that circle, there's a couple guys there. So you can see these are very large stalactites. What ended up happening was, is they had their cave, and these miners had a cave, and some guys went in there and shot the thing up with guns, broke down the stalactites, so they abandoned the cave. When they opened it up in 55 years, look how long the stalactites had grown. Interesting. In 55 years. Now, does it take millions of years for stalactites to grow? And the answer is, no, it does not. You have a wet season or a wet time. These things obviously can go very rapidly. Here is a piece of petrified wood that someone had formerly taken an axe and chopped into it. But now it's petrified. Very interesting. So if it's petrified, how old was it? Was this back in the time three million years ago when they supposedly say man evolved? I don't think so. This is a relatively recent stone. I just talked with a guy maybe a few months ago. He was telling me that he was, he was out hiking, and as he was, he was out there, he saw a piece of or a log that part of it was in water and part of it was not. And he said part of the log was petrified and part of the log was not. Very interesting. Here we have a petrified dog in a tree. Very, very interesting. And here's another picture. You can actually go there. Call them up. 912-285-4260. Go there, down there to Waycross, Georgia. If I'm ever in that area, that neck of the woods, I want to go see this dog. A petrified dog somehow, he, well, obviously he wasn't petrified at the time, but he craw crawled up into this tree, and as he did, he either got stuck, but he died in there, and he turned to stone. He's a rock. And the interesting thing is, if you look closely, you can see that even looks like his flesh turned to stone on him. Not just bones. Very interesting. Is petrification an intensely long process, as, we, as you may have been told? The answer is not necessarily. Not necessary at all. 
<clears throat> here's a mother ichthyosaur giving birth, birth, and the answer is that fossilization is not a slow process. This one is probably one of the most interesting. Here is a petrified cowboy leg inside of a boot that's not petrified. Very, very interesting. Now, do you think that's a three million year old boot there? I'm pretty sure it's not. Pretty sure it's not. His, and then you can see, if you, if you can see it well enough, right there in the top of the screen, <clears throat> what you see is that they have porous area, just like you would find inside of a what? Of a bone. It, absolutely clear that this is a petrified leg found inside of a boot that wasn't petrified. Now the question is, is how can this happen? I've heard a story of a, of a man who died. He was buried in the ground. The water table was very high in the area. Two years later, for some reason, I'm not sure what it was, they dug up the grave. They brought it out and it tipped. The man fell out of it and he had turned to stone within two years. So does this happen? The answer is absolutely yes. I always have to be careful about some stories about petrification. I'll tell you anyway. It's kind of crazy, but you're going to hear it. Basically, there is, there is two individual cases that I know of, of women who, who didn't know that they were pregnant. Many years passed. They must have had a miscarriage, but they never even knew they were pregnant. Time passed, and they be, one of them, or at least one of them I remember in particular, she had stomach trouble. She went into the doctor. She was opened up, and they found a petrified baby inside of her. This has happened at least twice. Petrification is not necessarily a slow process. And to clarify, this man who was in the ground that turned to stone, what it was, that high water table, somehow replaces the body with minerals, and as a result, they can turn to stone. Very interesting. But the reality is, you may have someone say, but Chad, you know, carbon dating, these kinds of things, potassium, argon dating, they prove to us that the earth is billions of years old. Well, the reality is, did you know that they would never use carbon dating for something that's millions of years old, ever? You ask a scientist, ask them, so does carbon dating date things as millions of years old? And the answer is no, they would never. It's only, they only use it for things that are what they consider relatively young, thousands of years old. But they use other kinds of dating, lead-lead dating, potassium-argon dating, other kinds of, of dating methods to, for things that are supposedly billions of years old. But let's look into this. Does this method work like they tell us in the textbooks? Like they tell us on maybe the Discovery Channel? It's a good question. Here it is. This is taken from Science, volume 141 from 1963. Our living mollusk shells were dated or carbon dated as being 2,300 years old. Now they're living, so they should not be quite 2,300 years old. They carbon dated a seal as having died 1,300 years ago. Well, that's a little bit troubling. You could tell that's a little bit off. Here they have it that a snail shells from living snails were carbon dated at being 27,000 years old. You know, one thing they don't tell you in class is that 50% of the dates they find when they use carbon dating or the dating methods, do you know what they do? They put it on the shelf or they, just, or they throw it away. They don't tell you about it. They don't tell you that half of the dates they come up with don't fit their theory, don't fit their model. So half the dates don't work. How would you guess that the other half work? And how would you know? The answer is you don't, and it's just a, a theory they've come up with. Notice this. This is interesting that part of the Velocevich mammoth was carbon dated at 29,500 years old, and another part was carbon dated at 44,000 years old. Now, that's a little troubling, don't you think, that two parts of the same animal are, you know, nearly 15,000 years apart? 15,000 year difference in one single animal. This is troubling, but they wouldn't share, with you, share that with you in school. I love this. This is very interesting. This is a new project that they came up with. It's, it's called the Rate Project. Basically, a group of scientists came together, and they asked the question, how can you know? How, how solid are these dating methods? potassium argon dating, and the other dating methods that the scientists use. So they said, let's actually test it out. Let's even use things that we know how old they are, send them in and ask them, how old is this? And see, if they give us the right dates, we'll know, okay, this is very good. This is a good scientific verifiable truth. But if it's not, we'll know that it's nothing more than a, a great concocted fairy tale. So what they did is they sent in rocks from a place called Ungarahoi. It's a, it's a mountain in New Zealand. It's actually a volcano. And people were there within the last hundred years to witness eruptions at this volcano. And the way it works is that if a volcano erupts, the lava comes out of it. And when that lava cools, that's year 
zero. Next year would be year one and so forth, just as a human being. Now, what are the dates that were given? See, what they did is they sent in samples. They said, well, we'll send in some samples from 1949, one from June of 1954, or some from June of, or the 30th of June, 1954, and a sample or some samples from the 14th of July, 1954, and then they sent in some samples from 1975. So they knew the exact dates. Why? Why did they know the exact dates? Because people had witnessed this so they could verify, and they could send this into the scientists and say, how old? are these rocks. You tell us. If you get the right dates, we'll know you're right. If you get wrong dates, well, that might be a problem. Well, they sent it in. They didn't send it to some creationist group to say, well, why don't you try to figure it out and give us some ridiculous dates. They sent it into the Geochron Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. These were not creationists who were testing these things. They sent it into these men who believe in the theory and who work to make this theory look true. And so what they did, they came up with these answers. Well, they said four of the rocks you sent us were less than 270,000 years old. One was less than 290,000 years old. One was 800,000 years old. One was, or three were 1 million years old. One was 1.2 million. One was 1.3 million. One was 1.5 million. And one was 3.5 million years old. Interesting, don't you think? Notice how close they were to the accurate dates. The dates were within basically 50 years old, and the dates they returned, the closest they were to accuracy, was about 270,000 years off. You see a problem with this method. You see, this is the great thing. They say, well, one of the arguments they say is this. You must understand that this only works well on old substances. Now, I want to give you a correlation to that. Get this with me for a moment. If I had a... <clears throat> A yardstick. And so I have my yardstick right here, and I say, how do you like my yardstick? It's touching the floor. And you say, Chad, there's something not quite right here about your yardstick. It looks like you're 5'9". It's looking like about 6 foot where you're, what you're showing me. And I say, no, 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 no. You, yeah, yeah, it goes to the floor, and it's, it's this tall, but you must understand this yardstick only works on large measurements. <laughs> Is that going to work? If it's wrong in the beginning, is it going to be right in the end? No. So here we have a, a, a test done on something to say, hey, let's see if it works. And none of them were right, not one. And so then they, they even dated it with other methods. I think it was lead lead dating. And they came up, they said, well, it's close to four, these rocks are close to four billion years old. So now they jumped up to even further off the mark. The trouble is, is that this, this method does not work. In theory, it works great. In theory, it works every time. But in reality, it does not work. But they won't tell you this in school. You won't get the entire story. It's troubling. But the question is, 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 is evolution science? The answer is no. You say, Chad, you don't believe in science. No, I believe in good science. Scientifically verifiable science. But not something that you can just purport, that you can just imagine. But that's what evolution is. It's something you can't see with your eyes. You can't handle with your hands. You can only believe it. It's a religion. It is a religion. There's no question about it. Now, in every case, the dates were off by nearly 250,000 years to 3.5 million years. That means they have a margin of error. And what is the margin of error in this test that they did? It was about 7 million percent. This means that if you were to guess how old a rock is, you'd probably do much better than the dating methods. You'd probably be much closer to the right date. Just guess, and you'll be all right. Now, this is, this is really neat. This is an article from Astronomy Magazine, June 1992. Now, it says, time to kill was the article. Now, it says Earth's rotation is slowing down. To compensate for this lagging motion, June will be one second longer than normal. This leap second announced by the International Earth Rotation Service in February will keep calendar time in close alignment with international time. What? They're telling us that Earth is slowing down. That's very interesting. The planet we live on right now is slowing down Right now, it's spinning at about 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. So it's spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. Absolutely amazing. Now, the trouble is, is it's slowing down. Every day, it's slowing down. Now, so the scientists, year after year after year, are actually keep changing our, our clocks because they have to make sure they're in 
time with the actual spin of the Earth. So our time is actually changing. And obviously, one second every couple years doesn't really make that big of a deal, but it does in a large amount of time. So what does this mean for us? Did you know that the spin of the Earth causes what is called the Coriolis effect? Basically, as the Earth spins, we begin to have wind. We have wind on the Earth. Now, I lived in Iceland for the better part of a year, as I said. And when I lived there, we had intense winds. I mean, to me, they were absolutely intense. It would be to the point where you would, you would literally be, be walking. You know, you'd be fighting just to, just to walk, walk down the road. I remember the first day I got there, I stood on the ice and blew, literally, literally just slid across the ice. And I asked somebody, is it always this, this windy? And they said, yes. And Oh, man, I have to live here for a while. You know, this is going to be tough. <clears throat> and I, then I asked somebody else because I wanted a second opinion, you understand. I asked, I said, is it always this windy here? And they said, yes. And so I was troubled, you know, I, you know realizing I'm not used to these kinds of things. And I'm not really sure why they told me yes, because it's not always that windy there. But I had to live with it for literally, literally months, months. And finally, what ended up happening one day, we were all sitting down at breakfast, and I looked out the window, and I noticed something was strange. Something was not right. And I didn't know what, I literally did not know what it was, and finally it hit me. It wasn't windy. Normally the trees were, you know, just doing this, and for the first time I looked out the window, and it it wasn't doing that. So it's extremely windy, but it's still habitable. You can still live in Iceland. My friend Nathaniel was walking down the road, and his glasses choo, just shot down the road, and he lost them for days. Literally, it's, it's intense. But the question is, did the winds kill us? No, they are still livable on this planet. But if you would go back in time, and you say, well, the Earth is slowing down, if you take the increments, go back in time, the winds would have been about 5,000 miles per hour at the equator. Or, I mean, the earth would have been, I'm sorry, the, the winds would have about, been about 5,000 miles per hour. Could you live with that kind of wind? The answer is no. You see, something is, if you go back in time, this, this theory of evolution just doesn't hold up. But they don't look at these issues. They don't bring them up in science class. They give you certain things. They make them sound so solid and so authoritative, but what? They only give you one side of the story. And that's the way it is in life. If, if you only hear one side of the story, it probably sounds pretty good. But when someone actually gives you the other side of the story, you realize, this isn't as solid as my, my professor told me, my teacher, my science teacher. Interesting. Now, <clears throat> if the Earth was spinning that fast a few million years ago, or a few billion years ago, what happened to the dinosaurs? I don't think so. Now, this is troubling if you believe in evolution, but if you believe that the Earth is, what the Bible says, about 6,000 years old, you have no problem, absolutely no problem. Now, let's go on to our final point. Here's a merry-go-round. How many of you have ever ridden on a merry-go-round? Okay, probably most of us here. Now, merry-go-rounds are very interesting, and notice this is just an imagination. You're just imagining here, this is not real. This is called phase one. These little kids are saying to these football players, spin us around. So they begin to spin. And then they jump up to 30 miles per hour. This is phase two. Now this is pretty intense at this point. The kids are hanging on with white knuckles, and this is our imagination. Now we jump up and we say, well, let's go on to phase three, and we begin to spin faster. And at phase three, the kids are flapping in the wind like, like a flag. But these children say, don't stop, keep going. And finally, they hit about 100 miles per hour. And as they hit 100 miles per hour, they begin to fly off of the merry-go-round. Notice, what direction is this merry-go-round spinning? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise, right? It's spinning clockwise. And notice, if it is spinning clockwise, any object or human that is upon this merry-go-round will spin off clockwise every single time. You say, well, why is that? It's according to what's called the conservation of angular momentum. So we realize that if you have a spinning central object, it's spinning, and something bursts off of it, what's going to happen? It's going to spin the same direction. Do you follow me? This makes sense. Well, all right, now according to evolution, everything began with a what? A big bang. All the nothing exploded, became helium. And hydrogen, mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium. And then it, be, it would be what? Spinning. So everything in our universe would be what? Spinning what direction? 
whatever direction the Big Bang was spinning, right? Does that make sense? Whatever direction. So now if we look off into the galaxies, if we look off even on our own solar system, is that what we see? All of our planets spinning the same direction? The answer is no. Venus and Uranus in our own solar system spin the wrong direction. Possibly Pluto, which is interesting. They can't see Pluto, but they can see stars way further than that. Interesting. But they also have galaxies spinning the wrong direction, or what we could consider backwards. Now the question is, is how could this be? And the answer is, there is no answer in evolution. What they do is begin to say, well, maybe there's many you know, different, different thoughts. Maybe there's many Big Bangs and all of these things going on. And they, you can throw any imagination into it. And that's exactly what they do. Throw in another theory. Throw in something else, something you can't see, something you can't touch, something you can't test. And that's what evolution is. It's an unverifiable science that cannot be disproven. It can't be. It's a religion. Because a religion is something that you believe based upon faith. You may not be able to test all of it, but you can maybe experience it. And it seems as if some people have maybe experienced this, but they have nothing to back it up. Nothing to test it, nothing to verify it. Now the Bible says that about 6,000 years ago, God created this planet. About 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. The Bible says that about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this planet and he died for us. Now, the Bible says in Psalms, chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, the sky, shows his handiwork. The Bible says that if you look up at the sky, you look at the stars, you can't see them as well in the city, but if you go out into the country and you look up at the stars, the Bible says they reveal to you that there is a God. I believe that. When we look at the order in the universe, if, if anything in the universe was just a, just a margin different than it is, everything would be in utter chaos. Everything. There are perfect laws that govern every bit of this universe. And scientists realize it is basically virtually impossible that if a, if a, if a universe was created by just nonsense or by nothing, that it would actually have all of these perfect laws. So we look up at the sky and we realize it couldn't be that way. It couldn't be that way. It just doesn't make any sense. We read in Psalms 8 verse 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you, you have ordained, it goes on to say, What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you even think about him with all of these stars, all of these planets off into the cosmos? What is it? What is it that makes God think about me? What makes him think about you? Why would he want to give his life for someone like me? And the question is, does it even matter? Who cares? Does it even matter? You know, I remember going to bed and, sure, I believed in God. Deep down, I, you know, I knew there was a God, but I wasn't living for him. I would go to bed and I, I would be empty. There was nothing in there. There was, you know, I could go to bed and, and, you know, maybe wish it was morning or maybe wake up and wish it was night, whatever. But I was empty. I was sure having fun, you know, maybe the night before I, I had a good time, but I would wake up empty, go to a party, do something fun, and have a good experience. But the experience never lasted. It was there while I was there, but when I was in bed, when I woke up in the morning, I was empty. And then I went to school and I, you know, thought, well, maybe happiness, you know, I, I, for time I thought maybe happiness was in relationships. Maybe I'll find happiness here. And I found out, no, that's not the essence of happiness. I thought, well, maybe, you know, being a tough guy, that's going to make me happy. Well, I found out that didn't, that didn't work. I thought, well, finally I was in college, and education, that's where it is. Taking philosophy class, you know, over there at Kelvin, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm learning amazing, amazing things. Now, time passed, and I remember learning about something called, it was uh, Descartes, it was his book called, on first philosophy, and I remember this was so deep. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to grasp this depth that I, that I came to as I understood this amazing book. What Descartes taught me was something that was unreal. He said this, he said, listen, he said, you, the whole essence of the book could be summed up in these words, you are here. Wow. Wow. Maybe a hundred pages to prove that you are here. I don't know how long it was. But what it made me do was made me think that I was thinking, right? 
It was awesome because I, I, I was grasping these new concepts. But if you ask a four-year-old, where are you? What are they going to tell you? I'm right here. Children don't have to question these things. You see, we come up with things with our human minds. We use big words and fancy illustrations. And finally we think, wow, that's deep. That's deep. And realize there's nothing to that. The Bible actually warns us. I, I was looking for happiness here, maybe in relationships and in drinking, whatever, and smoking and, and trying to find happiness in, in school, and I just wasn't finding it. And there's a verse in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, it says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, empty lies, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Notice this. It says, for in him, for in Christ dwells the fullness, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And it says, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So the reality, the Bible says, is you don't find happiness in relationships. That's not the essence of joy. That's not the essence of, of completeness. It's not in, in drinking drugs. It's not in education. It's not in anything this earth can give you, but the Bible says that you can find completeness in Christ. Only in Christ. And I can verify that from my own experience. You say, Chad, but you can't prove that to me, and you're right, I can't. Others can look at me and say, yes, he's had a changed life. But the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to experience it for yourself. Taste and you will see. Go forward, give God a chance, give him a try, and you will see. Ask him to reveal himself to you, and he will do that, if you have an open mind, an open heart. Now the question is, are you willing? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Bible, which has truth. Lord, I pray that you will draw us nearer to you. That will find answers. There's still many issues that we haven't tackled in this meeting. We'll be going into many more in the upcoming nights. But I pray, Lord, that you will give us open minds, each and every one of us, myself included. The reality is, I know there's a false idea of what open-mindedness is today. We think it means accepting anything but Christianity, basically. But Lord, coming to you is the only way, as you've just shown us to find true completeness. We can search everywhere. We can have fun for a while, have excitement for a while. But when we go to bed, when we wake up in the morning, we're still the same person. And the experience is gone. So Lord, I pray that you draw us all, each and every one of us, closer to you. And I thank you for being our God. In the name of Jesus, amen. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan, 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's Hope Video.